Our Law and Justice segment tonight, a newly released dash cam video may cast the death of Philando Castile in a new light. Castile was pulled over by Officer Geronimo Yanez for a broken taillight, but the interaction ended with the officer firing seven bullets into the car and killing Castile. Until now, this video has only been shown in the courtroom, but it doesn't look good for the officer who was just acquitted by a jury of his peers. Watch. I have to tell you, I do have a okay. firearm on okay. me. Don't reach for it, then. Don't pull it out. Don't pull it out. Oh, 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 With me now, nationally renowned forensic criminologist and police expert, Dr. Ron Martinelli. Dr. Ron, thanks for being here. No problem. How are you? I'm doing well. I wish that we would speak under more positive circumstances. It seems to me every time you're on my show, we're dealing with one of these tragedies, but your analysis on these videos is spot on. And I want our viewers, there's been so many opinions shared about this. I want our viewers to hear your analysis. So this video, the way that this interaction went down, the police officer pulled over Philando Castile for a broken taillight. I believe the officer suspected that Castile was a uh, robbery suspect. Castile had a pistol with him. Uh, with a valid license, he informed the officer. The officer told him not to reach for it, and I guess we don't know, we don't have video of whether he did reach for it. As he reached for the license, suddenly there were shots. What do you make of it? Well, first of all, the media does not have the correct forensic uh, explanation of this case, and I think that's causing a lot of problems. People, first of all, have to remember that when they're detained by the police, they have to do everything that the police officer tells them to do. 25% of all of our officers nationwide, historically over the past 12 years have been killed on car stops. Last year, we saw a 56% increase over officer involved uh, murders over the previous year. So officers are extremely aware of their officer safety. But contrary to what the media portrays, even though the entire contact between Officer, uh, Officer Yanez and Mr. Castile was, in fact, 40 seconds, the actual important segment of this contact took place in only five seconds. And contrary to journalists like Mr. Daniel Payne of The Federalist, who, who wrote a recent article, uh, Mr. Castile said he had a firearm, but never said he had a permit. So I want everybody to know that. He said, I've got a firearm. So you've got an officer that pulls somebody over for a robbery, and the officer is very calm. And then Mr. Castillo says, I've got a firearm, and the officer gives him numerous directions not to go for that. Mr. Castillo continues to reach down, and he grasps the dark object that the officer is watching, can't see for sure if it's a pistol, but everything in his mind at that point, the, the noncompliance with, with repeated orders, loud orders, uh, is consistent with someone that is reaching for a firearm. This entire uh, human factors situation took place, in fact, in milliseconds. It wasn't eight seconds. It wasn't four seconds. It was milliseconds. As a matter of fact, from the time he draws his gun to the time he fires all seven rounds was done in less than three and a half seconds. So this is what we refer to in forensics and in the legal community as a rapidly evolving situation that is tense and uncertain. And I mean, that's exactly what it was. Right. So, and it, I mean, it know, certainly ended in tragedy here. But let me ask you, I mean, where does it factor into the police officer's decision making or his course of action when the suspect, you know, says or just I guess the individual that he pulled over says, oh, I'm not reaching for my firearm. I'm informing you that I have a firearm. But he repeatedly says I'm not reaching for it. The officer told him not to reach for it. When you are non-compliant, remember, he thinks he's pulling over a possible robbery suspect. And people have to obey immediately what the police officer says. It doesn't matter whatever good intent the citizen has in, in trying to show the officer uh, maybe that he's going for a permit. The officer never knew he had a permit. All he knows is he's pulling over a possible robbery suspect. He's repeatedly told this individual not to grab anything, not to reach for anything. And the person, even though he's telling them, well, you know, I'm, I'm not reaching for it. That doesn't reconcile with what he's physically doing. And we know, in fact, he's reaching for something.
Okay, and and the officer has milliseconds to make a deadly force decision. So all of that has to be factored in. But the most important thing, and I think this is where people are confused, is when you get into court, the jury instructions are you must place yourself in the shoes of the officer and not into Mr. Castillo's shoes, because we are what? Judging the behavior on the officer on what the officer knew at the time or reasonably believed to be true at the time. Right. And I guess maybe that's my next question is the reasonable belief of feeling in danger, because I understand that police officers have to judge a situation based off of whether what they're feeling. But sometimes perhaps their feelings aren't accurate. Perhaps it wasn't in this situation. I don't know. That's why I'm deferring to you. You're the one that knows how to analyze these situations. Right. But just because he was feeling his life was in danger. I mean, didn't didn't this individual do what he was supposed to do? Didn't Mr. Castile inform the police no. officer that he was carrying a firearm legally as we're all supposed to do if we get pulled over and are carrying? Great question, Liz. And you know, I teach a lot of these uh, carrying concealed weapons classes to civilians. I'm teaching one this Saturday and I tell the civilians, keep your hands on the steering wheel, do not move, tell the officer if you need to tell the officer that you have a, a firearm, don't start out with, I have a firearm, start out with, I have a, per, a permit to carry a firearm and I have one on me. That way the officer can see you haven't moved, your hands are in the steering wheel, he's not going to get overly you know, concerned. And all you have to do is just follow the simple directions of the officer. You can't do what you want to do. You have to do what the officer needs you to do because the officer needs to control the car stop. And once right. you take control away from that, then the officer has to follow his instincts and what he reasonably believes is taking place. Right. And I understand that. It just seems like an awfully small, almost impossible distinction for someone who I'm sure their adrenaline is also flowing to, to know whether to say I have a firearm or I have a permit. And if that in the order in which you say that can be the difference between life and death. Dr. Ron, we're almost out of time. One more question here. Why was this officer fired then? You know, I don't know why the officer was fired. I will tell you that, uh, you know, and I've written about this in my book on the Black Lives Matter movement and the war on police. Uh, we have uh, municipalities that do uh, political investigations or make political and administrative decisions instead of forensic ones. You know, my job as a forensic criminologist that specializes in these things is to do a forensic investigation. And uh, and and let the chips fall where they right. may. So, uh, so essentially, this this officer could have been fired just because the police department didn't want to deal with the fallout or the politics from it. That's interesting, Dr. Ron. <laughs>